Welcome to the God Only Encouraging Message and Prayer Series. Messages from the heart of God. So that you know that you can receive mercy for your failures and find grace to help in good time for every need. That appropriate, well-timed help coming just when you need it. Today we're going to learn that God has divinely implanted eternity in your heart and your mind. That sense of purpose that only God can satisfy through his inner working through you by his mighty power. God has a purpose for your life. He tells you in Ephesians 2.10 that you're his new creation. You're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, that you have a purpose. But in having that purpose, that purpose has eternity in its destiny. And so by knowing that God has planted eternity in you, then that helps you understand there's a purpose for your life. Many people today go around feeling deep dissatisfaction or emptiness deep within them that they attempt to fill with everything from changing their circumstances to liking a different job or going into a new relationship or maybe even attempt to escape from reality using drugs and alcohol and some other type of media. They just can't figure out what's causing these feelings that are deep within them that's causing them to sense and know that something's missing in their lives. What's missing in their lives is that God has a place for himself in them, just as he does for you. And that can only be found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ coming to live in you and filling you with himself. Listen, there's no change in circumstance that's going to fix that God-sized void in your heart. There's no change in a job. There's no way that you can figure out or even come close to knowing what it is that's missing in your life until you find a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, he's the one that satisfies the need that he placed in you. Listen to that again. God is the one that satisfies the need he placed in you for that sense of belonging, for that sense of purpose. And he does it when you receive him and you walk in his power and you don't walk in your might, in your understanding. When you trust God, then you're listening to God who is eternal, who has made you for eternity and he has clothed you for eternity. Listen, God tells you, Not only has he implanted eternity in your heart and mind, but he also tells you that you are his creation to do his good works. Those are eternal good works that won't return void because he's empowered you to do them. He seated you to do them and he has given you eternal life to do eternal things in this world and shine his eternal light in the world, you being the very glory of God represented on the earth, being his child and a citizen of heaven. Listen, if accumulating more material goods or achieving greater success would ever make that void that God placed in you feel good, then there's many people that think that could have achieved it. However, even the rich young ruler you learn didn't find it either. He came to Jesus knowing he had everything in the world. But the one thing that he didn't have was the thing he came to seek, and that was God himself in the flesh, a personal relationship to be divinely connected with Jesus himself. And that's what the need of man is, to be divinely connected to God and knowing that being divinely connected to God, that God has a purpose for your life and that his purpose is a enduring purpose. It bears fruit and produces works that will last. And so God, in making you a new believer, making you a new child in Christ Jesus through the blood and the forgiveness that's found in Jesus' blood, now you, God, has clothed with eternity, as he says in Colossians 3.10. That means that you have a new spiritual self that you're ever in the process of being renewed and remodeled into a fuller and more perfect knowledge upon knowledge and in the image and the likeness of God who created you. Listen, when you know that God created you for eternity, 
and that he clothed you with eternity and he's given you eternal life, then that provides you with a grand entrance into the kingdom of God as his precious child, born of the spirit of God, redeemed by the blood of Christ and seated in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus in union and fellowship with God forever. Listen, the spirit of God is testifies with your own spirit to let you know that there's more to life than what you see. There's a lot more than what you see. God didn't just create you just to be born, live, and die, and then be buried in a grave. No. God has created you to know that he loves you and that he wants you to accomplish those things that he planned for you to accomplish on this earth that have enduring benefits in heaven. He tells you in John fifteen sixteen, you didn't choose me. I chose you and I called you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit will remain. That means that it has eternal value. So when you're doing the works of God that God has ordained you to do, not just an ordained minister, what I mean is that the Holy Spirit stirs you to want you to do something that God has already planned for you to do and you depend on him to do it through you, then you're fulfilling that eternal destiny that God has given you to do. It may be reading a book to a child. It may be smiling and encouraging somebody that's having a disappointing day. It may be as simple as just praising and thanking God for that opportunity that you got. Or it may be as praising and thanking him for that disappointment you just experienced because you know he's got something better for you. But in either way, you're developing an eternal sense of purpose, knowing that God in heaven, who has the absolute best in mind for you, will achieve it and make it happen in your life because you're a citizen of heaven. Listen, whenever we talk about living forever or talking about heaven, there's a lot of people that write me and they'll tell me, they're saying, you know, what's heaven like? What's heaven going to be like? What's it going to be like? And what do we have there? Well, you have to remember that before we jump into what heaven's going to be like, you have to remember something very specifically. You can only know heaven by what the word of God says. You can't know it by what some creative mind came up with, with what heaven is like or how heaven is real or any of these other things. Those are all good things to give you a hope for heaven, but it doesn't give you a description of heaven. God gives you descriptions of what he is doing, what he has done, what you can expect, who you'll see, and what you'll see when you get to heaven. And he does it in a list of certain things. But before you can understand those, you have to understand that the foundation of your eternal destiny is in Christ Jesus. The Lord himself provided the gift of grace and the gift of salvation so that you could have the assurance that heaven is your home. When Jesus came, he came and he said to you that I go and prepare a place for you. God himself sent his spirit to indwell you and seal you as his child until the day of redemption so that you can stand strong in your faith. The Holy Spirit has sealed you with the guarantee of your salvation that can't be broken by anyone. God has put you on earth only for a few moments when you look at the time of eternity. And that's to train you and prepare you for eternity. That's to get you so that you know what God needs you to know before he takes you to your new home. Listen, most people don't even think about heaven unless they're facing death. And they don't know what heaven's really like unless they seek knowledge on it or they look up information. But God tells you what heaven's like. Jesus himself said, don't let your heart be troubled. If you want to know about heaven, I'll tell you. He says, first of all, you have to believe me that in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go and prepare a place for you. What did Jesus say? He says, my father 
house has many mansions. Where is your father? He's in heaven. And what's Jesus going to do? He's going to prepare a place for you. Well, what was he in real life? He was a carpenter. And so as the carpenter, he's going to prepare a real place for you. He's also the son of the living God. The second born, uh, the, the born again child of the living God and the second person of the Godhead. Listen, he's God in the flesh. He is the very spirit of God incarnated. He's God himself incarnated. They're all three one. And God himself is saying, I prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare it, what do you think God's going to do? He says, I'm going to come back and get you. And that's exactly what he says. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you back to myself. And then he tells you, you may not know where I'm going yet, but you can know this. You will be going there soon. Then he tells you specifically that the way that you make it to heaven and the way to heaven is through Jesus, who is the truth and the life. He is the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father unless you come through Jesus. So today we're going to see how God has a specific purpose and journey for you and also that he's fulfilling it by his Holy Spirit working in you and through you. Very few people give serious thought of heaven as their eternal home. And so they don't really have a conviction about heaven. But you're going to find out about heaven today. And you're going to understand that God is the one that's preparing a place for you. And if he prepared a place for you, you ought to know what he's going to say about it. So we want to know what God says about it. We want to know what God is testifying in his word about heaven. Everything else is just speculation and hearsay. The Bible tells us everything you need to know and believe. It also tells you everything you can know for certain about heaven. So the first thing you can know for certain about heaven is your heavenly father lives there. That's what he tells you in Matthew 6, 9. He says in the Lord's Prayer, Thank you, Father, my Father, which art in heaven. Where's your Father? He's in heaven. And on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spoke about his Father who is in heaven in Matthew five sixteen. Instead of speculating on where heaven is, it's simply easier to say that heaven is wherever God is. Then he tells you the kingdom of God is in you. God is in you. So he's placed eternity in you just as he promised in Class Estes 3.11. For heaven is in you. The kingdom of God is in you. The next thing you learn is that your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is there in heaven. He told you that he goes to prepare a place for you in John 14. But he also, in his ascension in Acts 1.11, the two angels told the disciples that the Jesus who is taken up from here into heaven, he'll come in just the same way as he left. And you just watch for him as he goes into heaven. As he ascends to the Father and is now seated at the right hand of God, from there he intercedes for you. He's praying for you. And he will come back for you just as he promised because he's prepared a place for you. So he's coming back for you. Heaven is also a place that he did prepare specifically for you. It's not some eternal fog in which you just float around, but heaven is a specific place prepared by God where he's made a dwelling place for you in his kingdom, and he has made you a member of his own household, and he has seated you with Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. Listen, it's a real place, and he's prepared a place for you. If he's prepared a place for you to live, and he's seated you in the heavenly places, that means he prepared a place in the heavenly places for you too. Listen, Jesus said, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you. But I go and prepare a place for you in John 14 too. So heaven is a real place that has real prepared things for you. Then he tells you in Revelations twenty one twenty seven, nothing unclean and no one who practices abominations and lying shall ever come into heaven. 
but only those, listen to this carefully, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You as a born-again believer, your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus himself is the blood that certifies the guarantee of your position in the Lamb's book of life. Your citizenship is in heaven. The old gospel song used to say, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And that's true. Heaven is your home. Earth is your place where you minister and you work and you do the things that God wants you to do. By doing it through his power at work in you. Listen, you're not attached to the things of this world because God has attached you to the things of heaven. He's put eternity in you. He's clothed you with eternity, and he's given you eternal life. You've no longer clothed with the world. You no longer have the world's hopes, aspirations, and thoughts because God's given you higher thoughts. He's given you higher ways of doing things, and his ways gain you higher rewards than what you'll receive on earth. Philippians 3, 20 through 21 makes it very specific that your citizenship is in heaven from whom you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform your body, your holy body, and make it conform to his glorious body. These glorious bodies that you have are heavenly bodies. The earthly bodies you have They don't fit in heaven. Therefore, when Jesus returns, he's going to transform you into his glorious body like himself. Although you may not know exactly what it looks like, you can be sure of one thing in the new heavenly body. that It'll be more glorious and it'll be radiant more and more than the one you have now. The next thing is that your name is saved and recorded in heaven as a citizen of his kingdom. Jesus himself told us that when he sent them out and he brought them back in and they started proclaiming what God had been doing in Luke 10, starting in verse 17, they said, coming back, even the demons are subject to us in your name. But Jesus wasn't impressed with the display of power. He's told them, don't rejoice in the display of power that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is written and recorded in heaven. Verse 20. Listen, whenever anyone turns from sin to God and they believe the Lord Jesus Christ, they accept his sacrifice for their sin debt, they're born again. And when they confess it, They're confessing what God says about them. They're confessing who God says they are. You're a born-again child of the living God. Jesus is your salvation. And that person, his name is forever recorded in heaven. The next thing you have to know is that spiritually, believers are already in heaven. God views you in light of his relationship with his son and your relationship with his son, Jesus Christ who took your sins upon himself, and he gave you his perfect righteousness. He made an exchange for your sin debt for his righteousness himself. He was made sin for you that you may be made alive in union and fellowship with Christ, raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places, just as God proclaimed in Ephesians 2, 5 and 6. In God's mind, you're already his son or his daughter in the heavenly places. He seated you there. You're a citizen of heaven. You're an heir of God. You're in the household of God. And God loves you. And he has given you a spiritual guarantee of your position in heaven. So you can believe that Christ died and has sealed you forever and ever by his Holy Spirit. Because he has. And that's God's pledge to you that you will receive the inheritance which he promises you in heaven. He tells you that in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. No matter what you face now, your eternal hope is secure. And in God's presence, everything will be perfect. Sometimes you find that life is tough. And you find hope in knowing what the Lord is in store for you in heaven. 
I know I do, because I know that he has an eternal home for me. And my eternal longing is to be with him, because to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. And knowing that your heavenly position, that also creases your desire to know God and to do those things empowered by him that work in accordance with his good pleasure and delight and purpose to bring him glory. Listen, heaven is also where your treasure is. Jesus told his disciples that where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So he said, store up in heaven treasures where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not come in and steal. So your security is not found in money or property or anything else because God says your security is found in him and whatever you give to him, that's secure. And whatever you hold and whatever you try to do for yourself, that's not secure. A bank's not secure. There's nothing secure because something can go south at any time. But God is always secure because he's the creator of all things. Nothing is impossible to him. So we just thank you. The only thing that we really last in our relationship, Lord Jesus, is you. We just thank you that it does and that our heavenly treasures are your good deeds done through us, your good works done through us, your acts of kindness done through us, your dependence on you, our, the holiness you display through us, your fruits you display through us, your gifts you display through us. All these are actions of love and kindness and forgiveness that help us to inherit the rewards that you have planned for us. And our inheritance and our rewards are in heaven. You've stored them up. Salvation is by faith, not works. And once you're saved, you don't have to do good works to be God's child. All you have to do is do what God says and be his child. God wants you to trust him and depend on him as your number one and not trust in yourself or depend on him. That's not God. He says that I wish above all things that you would hear the voice of your good shepherd, that you'd hear your father's voice and voice of a stranger who you will not follow. So trust God. Know that God is for you. Rejoice and be glad that your reward is in heaven is great. And remember what Peter said in 1 Peter 1, 4. He said, you have an inheritance which is unperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven right now. God has an inheritance for you. The last thing that we want to cover is that You'll see those that have gone before you, your loved ones. You'll see those and you'll also see your friends. Because when a believer dies, he doesn't die. He literally is alive and he goes immediately into the presence of the Lord. Just as he said, to be absent in the body is to be present in the Lord. And then one day, Jesus returned for his body. And that's going to bring with him those who had died before us. It's also going to raise up those who are alive to meet those with us. And I just thank you, Father God, for it. I thank you that those who are resurrected first, they who are alive will remain and be caught up together with them who are in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord is what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. What a grand reunion you have to look forward to with all your friends and all your family and all your loved ones when you know that heaven is your eternal home. So, Father, I just thank you that heaven is our eternal home, that you watch over us, you guide us, and you protect us. You want the absolute best for us, so you gave heaven as our home. You gave your son as our salvation. You gave his life for our life that we might be sons and daughters of the Most High God. I just thank you for it. I just ask, Father God, that you show us how to use these words of yours most effectively, that people would trust in you with all their heart and lean not to their understanding, that they not hear my words, they hear your words, and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. I pray, Father God, 
that you would anoint this message for those people who need to know that heaven is for real and that they have a home in heaven and that they would know and understand that God truly, truly loves them and they are loved by God and greater is he who's in them than he who's in the world. So I just thank you, Father God, for all the manifold, wonderful blessings that you've bestowed upon us. And we remember that you love us with an unconditional love in Jesus' name. Well, remember, God loves you. I love you. And Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Depend on God. Walk in the grace of the dependence upon God and watch him move mountains on your behalf that are just impossible in your viewpoint but it's nothing too difficult for God to do for you. God will do it. Trust him and leave the consequences to him and thank him for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.